Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Robert Campbell, publisher of the RealEstateTiming.com newsletter. He's speaking to us from beautiful San Diego. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Thank you very much, Jim. Bob, I think the big question in your newsletter this week was, uh, should you buy or should you rent? That is the, I'm so glad that you're, that's your first question, Jim, and we're focusing on that because this is something that I've just learned recently, that most people think renting is like throwing money away. It, it's just a waste of money. And that's true some of the time, but certainly not all of the time. And if you look at long-term charts, the only time that, that owning a home is better than renting is when home prices are appreciating and appreciating at a significant rate. Otherwise, during real estate corrections, which are part of the cycle, which is just like day and night, when real estate's going down, it's less expensive to rent by a wide margin. And today, here in the United States, for example, that the to own a home, I, I don't have my newsletter in front of me, but I believe to, that to pay every, all the costs of owning a home, you know, like mortgage, uh, mortgage payments, taxes, insurance, a little bit of maintenance and all that stuff. I believe the, the average, for the average price home in the United States, that payment would be 2800 bucks a month. And to rent that same home, it would be 1800 bucks a month. So there is a thousand dollar a month difference. But the key is, what direction are housing prices going to go? And the direction that housing prices are going to go is down. So right now, you know, put aside all your personal pre- preferences about, yeah, you, you don't, you know, you can't paint the house and you, and you can be, you know, asked to leave and all those other things from a purely financial standpoint. Let's say that renting is a much better, a much better option financially now than owning. And so, and one way to get around the, you know, the, the inconveniences of, 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 you might go out and get yourself a, um, a two year lease or maybe even a three year lease. If you're a good tenant and you can pay the rent, you know, pay them an extra hundred bucks a month and say, hey, I'll pay you an extra hundred bucks a month. Instead of 1800, I'll pay you 1900 bucks, uh, 1950 on one condition. What's that, sir? That you give me a three year lease and most likely to go, deal. Now you're in the house for three years. Now you got three years where the home, home price is going down, which is going to be significant, and you'll deal with the situation uh, again when, when your lease is up. But it's really interesting. When I wrote my book, Timing the Real Estate Market, everybody, I was totally unaware of that. And, and when I write my, my second book, Time in the Real Estate Market, which is going to be, um, you know, it's not going to replace my first, but be in addition to it, it's going to include things like that. So it's very, very key. But right now, with it, it's, it's a much better choice financially to rent than buy. Now, what about those who say a mortgage payment is really a forced savings account payment because of the equity you're building up in your house, and eventually it's paid off and you can use that equity for other things? Well, that, that if you look at it over a 30-year period of time, um, yes, I mean, I guess that is a true statement. However, do most people live in their home for 30 years? No. The average American lives in his home anywhere between, you know, seven and ten years, depending on, you know, the, the source. So most people don't live in their home. 
and again for that long. And again, yeah, if, if you're committed to that period of time, yes, you will own your, if, assuming that nothing changes in your life, there's no life events over that 30-year period. Uh, somebody doesn't die. Somebody doesn't get sick. Uh, you don't get divorced. You don't get a, a, a job transfer, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, that, that may work out for you. But I would, ma- I would rather manage risk more actively than that because those kind of things are going to come up in your life, you know. I mean, 50% of the people in the United States get divorced. That may- and most of the time they get divorced during bad economic times instead of good economic times. So housing prices are going to be lower rather than higher. And, and when somebody gets divorced, everything gets sold, including the family house. Most people don't have the money to, 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 to buy the other partner out, especially at today's prices. Here in San Diego, the average price home is 950 bucks. So a husband and wife get divorced, that one of the other partners is going to have the ability to, to um, pay the mortgage on a $950,000 house on their own. No, they're not. They're not. So the house gets sold. So hard economic times hit, you know, that financial troubles, you know, bring about a divorce. The house gets sold during, during down times, during up times. So... I'm one of those people in all facets of my life. I like to manage the risk that is at hand. I don't worry about what the um, what may happen in the future. It's what's happening now and what are the trends. And if you can adjust, adjust, adjust to those trends um, that successfully over the years, that you're going to be you're going to be happier and most um, and and more financially successful than people that don't. With the Fed continually raising rates and hints of even more rate hikes, what's this going to do to real estate? Maybe not today, but uh, a few months or a year from now. Let's say down the road. Yeah. yeah right. The, okay. The, interestingly, in my book, Time in the Real Estate Market, I, I identify five key indicators that you, have, that you have to stay focused on to have a, a excellent sense of what direction housing, housing prices are going to go. Interest rates are one of those. But um, the, interestingly, that's the least predictive of all of my indicators. The other, the other four, by the way, everybody, are um, uh, existing home sales, new home building permits, uh, mortgage defaults, and foreclosures. And the fifth one is interest rates. Interest rates are the least predictive because if you look at over history, and, and most people are totally wrong about this. They go, oh, my God, if the, if the Fed starts dropping interest rates, which they're not going to do, um, the um, housing prices are going to start taking off again. That's not true. That's not true. If you look at the downturns that happened in the past, like look at the downturn in the United States in the, the, where housing prices peaked in 1990 and they hit bottom six years later in 1996, mortgage rates fell two percentage points during that downturn. During the bubble, when they peaked in 2006 and hit bottom in 2012, mortgage rates decreased by three percentage points. So the thing is, housing prices can rise during rising, during rising mortgage rates, and they can fall during falling mortgage rates. So that's not the most key indicator to follow. What's uh, the biggest indicator for you right now? Um, foreclosures in process. Yeah. Are, are they starting to go up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they hit bottom in, about two years ago, and they're in, a, they're in, a, um, in aviation terms. They're in about a 15-degree climb. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's, n- nothing, nothing crazy yet, right? But they're climbing. They're, and they're climbing, and that's very – And so you have to look at that and say, okay, if things are so good, why are foreclosures rising? And, and the only reason is people are getting in trouble. And for a reason why, why housing prices haven't gone down uh, more than they have during this downturn, it's strictly supply and demand. The supply and demand, supply, the, the, the demand for homes, as measured by existing home sales, has gone down, let's say, 20%. And in tandem, the inventory of homes for sale has gone down 20%. So the, um, essentially, supply and demand are back in equilibrium, almost no different than they were during the peak. That's why, at least nationally, the housing prices in the United States are, you know, like 1% below peak prices in, in uh, June 2022. It's different in California, though, guys. Mm-hmm. 
California, and, and some of the western states. That's the United States. Some of the western states, like California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Seattle's the weakest city in the United States, followed by, followed by um, San Francisco. Seattle just went afterburner to the upside, and now they're crashing. You know, they're, not, they're probably 10% below peak prices, where the average price home in the United States is only, you know, is like 1% below. But there's some places that are even above, above peak prices. So, but it's all about supply. There's no supply. For whatever reason, people aren't putting their homes on the market, even as demand falls. But that will change. That will change. And I tell people, look, all you have to do is look at a chart. Go, let's go back 50 years in the United States. I'll show you a chart. Boom, bust. Boom, bust. Boom, bust. Four times that has occurred in the last 50 years when prices got too high. This time, this was the biggest bubble ever. Do you think it's going to really think it's going to be different this time? What are the odds of it being different this time? What, 10%? Would you make a bet on 10%? That you'd bet a dollar that you have a 10% chance of winning. If, so if the 10% chance comes through, you win a dollar. 90% you're going to lose a dollar. Only a fool will make that bet. So all you have to do is look at the past and say, housing is cyclical. Everybody knows that. Look at the pattern. Look at the rent pattern that you just referred to, Jim. That w- look how high r- housing prices are relative to, relative to rents. And what happens when that occurs historically Housing prices revert back to rental prices and even fall below. That's what happens. That's a history lesson for everybody. That's what happens. And to think it's going to be different this time, is that possible? Of course it's possible. Anything's possible. Is that what's likely to happen? No, it's really unlikely to happen. So that's, I'm really glad you brought up that point about, you know, is it che- that um, the cost to buy versus the cost to rent because the studies have been done, done on that. And I'll tell you guys, I haven't told anybody this before. That's one of my secret indicators. That I, I tell everybody about 90 to 95% what I know. Do I tell them everything if I come up with a, wow, look what I know, and most people haven't figured it out yet. No, I don't tell them about it. That's just one of my secret in my back pocket indicators that I use because historically it's been, it's been so predictive of which way housing prices are going to go in the past. You can't bet against it, guys. You're full betting against it. You, so, you, so I don't. Are people, uh, the house builders, the developers, how are they doing and what are they doing? They're, they're doing just fine. Because one, there's no existing existing inventory, and the new home builders, even though the price of their inventory, their homes for sale, has again come down significantly more than existing homes, they're still discounting prices, they're selling prices, and they're selling homes. In fact, the the, the typically typically the um, that over the over the course of time, a new home will cost, on average, 15% more than an, than an existing used home. And that makes sense. It's a brand new home. Now, they're the same price. They're exactly the same price. So, in other words, the, the home builders are still continuing to sell their product because the price has come down, and they're the same price as existing homes. If their price was, like, typically 15% more than the, the existing homes, that wouldn't be the case. But that's really interesting. I don't recall that ever happening, guys. And I've been following these markets since I was uh, one years old, and my dad had me, um, you know, um, I don't know what he had me. He didn't have me doing much on his job sites, but I was there. (laughs) We'll have more with Robert Campbell right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. We're speaking with Robert Campbell. Bob, Fed rate hikes, are they scary or are they needed to correct market forces? They're needed. I mean, from a stamp, it, okay, it, it depends whose who's ox you want to gore. If you're a rich guy that owns stocks, that owns real estate, 
You want the Fed to stop raising rates and start lowering rates. Okay, if you're, and, I, I, and when I say rich guy, I would put rich guys in the, um, like, let's say you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the United States. Forget about the, the 1% or the tenth of 1%, all those guys. Those guys are just crooks, you know, feeding off corruption and inside information. You want, you want rates to go down. But from the standpoint of everybody else, you want rates to go up if for no other reason to cause a recession that will bring that will bring housing prices down because that's your only hope of ever buying unaffordability is it is is at record highs right now or near record highs it's so close let's just but you know for, for for the sake of simplicity let's it hasn't come down at all in fact almost you look at peak prices back in 2022 uh, June 2022 versus what they are today. You know, back in 2022, mortgage rates were like, you know, three and a half, four percent. Now they're double that. Now they're seven percent. So you factor in seven percent, seven percent into, into a house that hasn't gone up in price that, I mean, hasn't gone down in price. So unaffordability is just as bad today as it was then. And that's what ultimately kills markets. You can't housing market. You can't afford a house. That's another key indicator. You can't afford that unaffordability. And just go back and look at a chart. Just go back and look at a chart. Go back and look at a 50-year 50, 50 chart of, of um, housing affordability. When it gets high, when it, when it reaches certain levels, it's a danger zone. What happens when it reaches those levels? Housing prices go down. The next up cycle, it gets in the danger zone. What happens to housing prices? It goes down. Are the danger zones, um, is, is, is the current danger zone close to where it was during the previous danger zone? Yeah. There was, you know, there was kind of, you know, red line and blow up in about the same general range. And so that, that's what the charts tell you. The best way to predict the future, guys, is to study the past. It's to study the past. And it's not that hard. That's one of the biggest revelations that I've learned in the last 22 years since I wrote my book. Study the, look at past chart patterns and just observe them and say, okay, wow. Look, you know, housing affordability was super low back here during this period of time. Um, what happened after that? Housing prices went up. Then all of a sudden, housing prices kept going up, 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 like they do during an up cycle. And then housing, uh, um, housing affordability got really low. What happened after that? Housing prices go down. You know, it, it's a repeating pattern, guys. Patterns repeat because people do the same thing over and over and over again. And, you know, that's one of the, it's the cyclical patterns that, you know, even though I referenced them in my first book, I didn't address them as, as, um, as, you know, focus on them like I'm going to do in the second book I write. Just look at the chart. Look what happens when things get here. What happens? Bad things happen. Housing prices go down. And what happens when they get here? They go down. They go down. And when, when they get here, they go up. So, I mean, you can't use that as the perfect timing indicator, but when you use them, you use them in conjunction with the five indicators that I've, um, um, you know, presented in my, my first timing book, that's as good as it's going to get, guys. That's as good as it's going to get. And, and so why am I so focused on this? Real estate's my favorite asset class. I've made more money in real estate than anything. And right now, personally, what I'm waiting for, um, I'm waiting for the, um, I'm, w- I'm waiting for this, and I'm, I'm as patient as can be. There's no urgency to jump in this market at all, zero. So the, I'm going to buy a high-end fixer in the area that I live in, and um, we're going to buy it at the bottom of the cycle. We're going to rent out our existing home which is very nice. We're going to rent it out. We're going to make it our personal home. We're going to move into it. I'm going to fix it up, doing my Robert Campbell magic that I'm, I'm excellent at because I've been around the, uh, the home building business my entire life, and my dad built multi-million dollar homes in Rancho Santa Fe for 55 years. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of that. I know what's nice. I'm going to ride the cycle up, then sell it for probably, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the next cycle is going to be, a million Million and a half dollar profit, you know. Take our take our husband and wife to five hundred thousand deduction. Pay the tax or something on five hundred to a million bucks, and um, that uh, tell the renters in our own home, give them three months' notice that we're going to move in, move and move back into our old house. So we'll be, we'll be sitting back in our own house with a, um, you know, and just with a. Even though the money's not the biggest thing anymore, 
you know, was probably a, a million and a half extra dollars in the bank. But it, it's more than the money, guys. It's the fact that you're playing the game successfully. And you, I want to show people how to do it. And I'm going to show my followers what I'm doing. Here's what you, and if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, maybe not everybody doesn't have the building and design skills I do. Um, maybe they have to hire it, but I'm showing the process. If you have to hire them, hire it. I don't need to hire anybody. But I, but I do, when I run into a jam, I hire designers to come in and help me out if I can't figure it out on my own. But there's nothing like doing it yourself to show people how it, that it can be done. And plus, it's, it's playing the game successfully. I mean, I don't mean to. This, what Warren Buffett, does he need more money? No, of course not. Why does he still play the game? Because he wants to show you that he still can and that he can be successful at it. I'm sure that's very, very um, empowering to him. That, well, what else is he going to do? So he keeps playing the game, and he's, and he's been very successful at it his whole life. And, that's, and this is something that I'm going to start sharing with my followers. Here's how you do it. The best way to make money in real estate, hands down, is to buy real estate when it's cheap at the bottom of the cycle, add, buy a home that needs repairs, that, you know, add value to it the best way you can, um, ride, the, ride the appreciation cycle on the way up, and sell, sell during the peak. Is that always easy to do? No. Is it done? Yeah, it's done all the time. And that's how you make the most money in real estate. You don't have, most people out there in real estate, they're like, I, I liken them like the flippers. They're like sharks. A, a shark always has to be moving in order to live, right? These, so are these flippers. They're always flipping. They're always looking for the next deal. You know, oh, we got this deal. Oh, we got this. Now I need, we sold this, and how'd you do on that? Ah, we did okay. You know, this one, oh, yeah, we did real. How'd you, yeah, we lost money on this one. But nevertheless, they're always in the game doing that. It's almost like being a day trader. There are sharks that have to keep moving or they're going to die. There's a much better way for the average guy to make money in real estate. Flipping's a business. That's not an investment. The key is buying low. That's the key, guys. You, and I know you guys up in Canada there, you're in your own downturn right now that, you've, that you haven't seen in 15 years. But it appears that this may be the real deal for you guys, too. Just be patient. Be patient, find a way to time the market, you know, so you know when it's at bottom. Buy, buy a home. If you already buy, have a home that you live in, buy a rental. Buy two rentals. If all of a sudden, if you own your home free and clear, but, you know, move out. Buy a, buy a house that you can move into. See, we have tax laws here in the United States. As long as you live in a house for two out of five years of ownership, and, and it's your own personal residence, when you sell, that a husband and wife get a $500,000 tax exclusion. That's a big deal, guys. That's tax, that's tax free. And especially here in California, where, you know, there are no capital gains taxes. We have the highest state taxes in the country, you know, 13.5%. So you add that on to 20% national, um, you know, um, national capital gains, you're talking about that when you make a profit, even if it's a long-term profit, if you live in California, your gain is, your gain is taxed at 35%. You gotta get away from the taxes, guys. You gotta find a way, the best way to beat the tax man. Otherwise, you're just on a, you're on a treadmill, and you're just, you're, you're running your ass off, and not getting anywhere. So that's why you gotta try to use that, you gotta be very strategic what you do to get by today. Are there any, uh, quick fixes or tricks to turn a property around and make a big profit on it. Friends of mine in Winnipeg used to take old mansions and, and fix them up, and they said gold trim and a flagpole really does the trick. <laughs> well, I've been around the building business my entire <laughs> life, and I know there's always this. Here's all you have to do. You know what? No, there are no easy fixes. I'll tell you the most mis... I'll, t I'll tell you a secret to making a lot of money in real estate that most people don't realize is spend a lot of money on landscaping, especially on front of the house, and I always do. There's where I hire a landscape architect, and a good one, because that's a skill that, that, that I don't have. I mean, can I design things in a home? Yeah, I'm really good at it. I mean, when it comes to designing landscaping, where to put the tree, you know, how the walkway should curve into the house, you know, where the, where the, where the wall should be. No, 
No, I'm not very good at that. So I hire a really good landscape architect. And so what will I pay him? Whatever he wants. I mean, let's just say today you've got to pay him uh, two grand just to do the design work. I don't, want him to, I don't want him to install the landscaping. I just want you to give me a plan, and we'll talk about it. Yep, I love the plan. Thank you very much, sir. Here's your two grand, and then I'll, I'll execute the plan. But that landscaping will make you more money than anything, guys. And let me tell you why. You can get the most beautiful home in the world with crap landscaping in front of it, and it looks like a crappy product. You can take an average home and just pimp out the landscaping with beautiful design and mature trees, and you'll sell that home so fast and for more money than you'll ever believe. But most people, that's where they cut back. They cut back on landscaping, and it's, 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 you're being, you're being um, penny-wise and pound-foolish. Spend the money. Spend the money on less in the front of the house, not the back of the friggin' house. When, they, when somebody drives by and looks at your house, they, it's first impression. Somebody's going to look at that and go, hey, that's a beautiful home. I like that home. But if you've got crap landscaping in front of it, they're going to go, hmm. And that's that first impression. You're, so you've got to make that first impression. It's from 50 years' yeah. experience, guys. <laughs> I don't know about the black flag poles. <laughs> uh, well, not black, but uh, they, they took mansions and basically they looked – uh, like many embassies. <laughs> oh, and, and some of those old mansions, I've never done an old mansion, but the, the, you know what? I mean, for example, in San Francisco, they have some of those Victorians. Yeah. To, re, to, to refurbish those Victorians, Jim, that's a lot of money, dude. I mean, there's like, there's like about seven different colors, and there's, there's all these different trims and, and, and doodads and that kind of thing. I've never done a house like that before. Everything's done off scaffolding. I'm a Southern California boy. Everything's like Spanish, single story, you know, sometimes two story, but, you know, only about 50% of the time. So that's what I know. The, you know, all of a sudden, you, the, 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 and the, the best real estate deal, I, the most money I've ever made in real estate was this. Back in 1990, during the start of the downturn in, in San Diego, I bought a 5,000-square-foot home on a one-acre site in San, on, on, on a, um, a public golf course. The first hole of the golf course sat right there. 500000 cash. I took a year off. I put $100,000 of money into that house. I did, I, I did some of the work myself, but certainly maybe maybe... 20%, because when you have a house that big, I mean, there's like 70 passage doors. It, it, take, it would have taken me two months to paint the inside of that house, so you hire most of it out. But where I really spent the money and put the time in was in the landscaping. I took a, I, we, got, we got equipment out there, and we completely removed everything that was around the house, everything. It was a dirt, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a nice house with trees. We took everything out. I hired a landscape architect. We came in. And, the, and, and, and we changed everything, the walkways, the trees, everything, the way the whole house was set up, how the lawn, the lawn wrapped all the way around the house and everything. I sold that house. I bought it for 500 I put 100 into it. I sold it two years later so we could get our tax advantages on it. I sold it for $1.2 million. There wasn't a comp on, that was in a bad market. There wasn't a comp on that street, all one acre homes. It was a, it was a very nice area. You know, that was back in the day when a million dollar home was, was really a nice home. <laughs> it was something special. I mean, unlike today. The, um, but I sold it for 1.2 million and all my real estate buddies went, wow, look what Bob's pricing his home at. 1.2. There's no comps. He, he was 20% over the market at a minimum. He's never going to go get that, even though, they, even though they knew it was a nice place and they loved the house, everything I had done to it. Everybody just said, no, he's asking too much. I sold it, and it was all, at least 50% of it was the landscaping. And, if, you know, one of these days on my, on my, blog, on my website, I'm going to do a blog post of it before and after, and it's going to blow your mind what I did with the – I didn't change any square footage in the house. I didn't move a wall. Nothing. Nothing. But the landscaping, I spent so much time on that landscaping. And, and then after I, we lived in, every Saturday, 
for as long as we lived there, I spent all day taking care of the landscaping. I didn't mow the lawns and trim the lawns and all that because that was too much work. We had all these walkways and, you know, I had to have a professional service. Shit, that would have taken, I, w- I wouldn't have been able to do the job they did. But the rest of the time, I made sure that landscaping was perfect. Trimmed out all the trees, thinned out all the plants. And that's what sold the house, guys. Sold the house. I made a $600,000 profit. I've never made that. I, I made 100% profit on that house in, in um, less than three years in a bad market. And I'm telling you, I attribute most of it to the landscaping. People, the person that came up to that house went, wow, wow. This is the kind of house that I want to live in. Mature trees, mature lawn. The lawn was perfectly green, perfectly manicured. All the plants looked like it came out of, uh, you know, was a, uh, the Getty Museum. But it was worth it. It was worth it. And that's what I'm going to do again. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. You're welcome, Jim. I'll, we'll, we'll catch you again next month, okay? My guest has been Robert Campbell, publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter. He was speaking to us from San Diego. If you have any questions for Bob or any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street, or as some people are now calling it X. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.